Steve Ditko is an American comic writer and artist. He is best known for co-creating popular superheroes such as Spider-Man and Doctor Strange from Marvel Comics. He also created numerous other characters from various publishing companies, including Blue Beetle, Captain Adam, The Creeper, Hawk and Dove, Mr. A, The Question, Shade the Changing Man, and many, many others. Ditko was strongly influenced by objectivism, the philosophy by Ayn Rad, and his work often reflected objectivism's belief in moral absolutism. His philosophies would cause conflict between him and Stan Lee, which ultimately led him to quit drawing Spider-Man and even quit working at Marvel altogether. As time went on, he became more of a recluse, hiding away from society, never giving interviews, and ultimately ended up all alone. Born in Johnstown, Pennsylvania in 1927 to Stephen Ditko, a master carpenter and his wife, Anna, a homemaker. Steve was raised in a typical working class family as the second of four children. Steve's father introduced him to newspaper comic strips of the 1930s and the 1940s. And the family's favorite was the adventure series, Prince Valiant by Hal Foster. As Steve grew up, his interest in both comic strips and comic books also grew. During his adolescence, his favorite characters were Batman and the Spirit. After graduating from Greater Johnstown High School in 1945, Ditko enlisted in the United States Army in October of that year and spent his military service in the Allied occupied Germany. While there, he drew comic strips for the military newspaper, marking his first comics related work despite his lack of formal training at the time. After being discharged from the Army, Ditko had the opportunity to pursue a college education thanks to the GI Bill, a law that provided benefits to returning veterans, including tuition and living expenses for attending high school, college, or vocational school. In 1950, he chose to enroll at the Cartoonist and Illustrator School, later known as the School of Visual Arts in New York City. During his studies, Ditko found a mentor in veteran comic book artist Jerry Robinson, who worked on the Batman series, he also co-created Robin and the Joker. Robinson was impressed with Ditko's dedication and work ethic and encouraged him to create his own characters and stories. After graduating in 1953, Ditko began his professional career as a comic book artist, starting with the science fiction story Stretching Things for Stanimore Publications. This was sold to Ajax and Pharrell, where it finally found publication in Fantastic Fears No. 5, cover dated 1954. In October of 1953, Gilmore Magazines published Paper Romance, which was both Steve Ditko's second professional story and his first published work, which got published in Daring Love No. 1, cover dated 1953. Shortly after, Ditko was hired by the studio owned by comic book veterans Jack Kirby and Joe Simon. While working for them, he received additional training from his colleague, Mort Meskin, who admired his ability to create and detail composition without clutter. Some of Ditko's earliest known work was published by Prize Comics, a Crestwood publication imprint co-headed by Kirby and Simon. In 1954, Ditko began working for Charlton Comics, where he contributed a vampire story titled Cinderella and his first comic book cover ever for The Thing number 12. During that time, Ditko was working on more and more horror type comic books, but in 1954, the Comics Code Authority came out and started passing laws restricting more of the gruesome and horror elements of comic books, and it really prevented him to establish himself as a horror artist and developing those skills. He continued working on and off until the company closed in 1986. He even co-created Captain Adam in Space Adventures 33 in 1960. In less than a year, he drew 170 pages and 19 covers for Charlton. However, in 1954, Ditko contracted tuberculosis and had to take a break from his comic book work. He recuperated at his family home in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. By 1955, he had recovered, but Charlton Comics was knocked out of operations by a hurricane. And in 1956, he returned to New York and was hired by Atlas Comics, Marvel Comics' predecessor, where he primarily illustrated surreal stories written by Atlas's writer and editor, Stan Lee. His first work at Marvel was a four-page, there'll be some changes made in Journey in the Mystery, 33, April 1956. Shortly after, Atlas switched distributors, which later got sued, leading Atlas' entire staff to be laid off. 
Ditko returned to Charlton in 1957, which had recovered from the hurricane damage. There he started to experiment with various drawing styles in series such as Tales of the Mysterious Traveler and This Magazine is Haunted. Then during the summer of 1958, Stan Lee asked Ditko back to Atlas. Ditko's contributions to Atlas appeared in various anthology titles such as Amazing Adventures, Journey to Mystery, Strange Tales, Strange Worlds, Tales of Suspense, and Tales to Astonish. His captivating stories made him a popular artist and earned him the lead role in Amazing Adventures by 1961. The series was later renamed Amazing Adult Fantasy to reflect the more sophisticated nature of its stories, which deviated from Atlas Marvel's typical output. Ditko's stories were created using the Marvel method, a collaboration process between the writer and artist in which the writer provided a brief outline of the plot and the artist flushed out the story and provided illustrations. This gave Ditko significant creative input into each story, but he did not receive credit as a co-writer or co-plotter. In the early 1960s, Stan Lee had an idea for a new superhero. This superhero would be a teenager. He went to then owner Martin Goodman and asked if he could use this character in an upcoming issue. Martin Goodman was a little on the fence about the character so decided to put him in Amazing Fantasy 15 because they were canceling that anyways. Stanley then assigned the task of designing this new character to his main artist, Jack Kirby. However, Lee rejected Kirby's initial design and instead turned to Ditko, who was the company's second most prominent artist at the time. I first gave the strip to Jack Kirby to draw. And Jack drew the first couple of pages, and I was looking over his shoulder, and I said, wait a minute, you're, you're still making them too glamorous looking. So I said, ah, oh, forget it, Jack, I'll give it to someone else. So it occurred to me to give it to Steve Ditko, and Steve brought so much to the strip, and I don't think the strip would have been as successful without Steve. Ditko's version of the character was accepted and he went on to design Spider-Man's original costume, incorporating a face mask to conceal the character's feature, a shoeless outfit that enabled the wall crawling, and a concealed wrist shooter. He also created Spider-Man's web gimmick and spider signal. Although the idea of the webs emanating from the character's hands was credited to Ditko's then roommate, fetish artist Eric Stanton. Spider-Man's origin story was published in Amazing Fantasy 15, August of 1962, which became a top seller, prompting Marvel Comics to launch a new series for the character titled The Amazing Spider-Man in March of 1963. Ditko served as the series' primary artist for the first 38 issues, from March of 1963 to July of 1966. Although Stan Lee did end up using Jack Kirby's cover for Amazing Fantasy 15, because Kirby's cover art features Spider-Man in a dramatic pose, swinging from web and holding a man under his arm while a group of criminals fled from him, the cover perfectly captured the excitement and action of Spider-Man's character, and it helped to generate buzz and interest in the comic book. Besides Spidey himself, Ditko co-created most of his early supporting casts and early foes, such as Doc Ock, Green Goblin, The Lizard, Mysterio, Scorpion, Gwen Stacy, and many more. Ditko wasn't originally getting credit for his contributions to the plot, so he demanded Stan Lee to give him credit, which Stan Lee eventually gave into Ditko's demands for plot credit. And from issue 25 onward, Ditko began to receive plot credits for his contribution to the series. One of the most highly regarded issues that Ditko plotted was the issue number 33 titled, If This Be My Destiny, in which Spider-Man is trapped under heavy machinery and is plagued by visions of the past failures before eventually summoning the strength to escape. The story is widely regarded as one of the best in Marvel Comics history. While continuing to work on Spider-Man, Ditko also co-created the character Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange was introduced in Strange Tales 110 in July of 1963 and Ditko continued to provide artwork for the series. His art was highly praised for his surreal and psychedelic visuals, and the Doctor Strange series became a favorite among college students in the 1960s. The character was a magic user whose adventures took place in a strange and mystical dimension. During his time on Doctor Strange series, Ditko also introduced several of Marvel's earliest cosmic characters, including Eternity, a living embodiment of the universe. In addition to Spider-Man and Doctor Strange, Ditko also contributed stories from other Marvel characters of the time, such as the Hulk and Iron Man. He is also credited with designing the character of the leader in 1964, who has since become one of Hulk's primary adversaries. Over the years working for Marvel, Ditko and Stan Lee didn't really exactly see eye to eye. 
and their relationship began to sour over time. And then ultimately in 1966, Steve Ditko left Spider-Man and Marvel altogether. Their relationship had gotten so bad to the point where they were no longer communicating directly. And instead, any changes to their collaborative work were handled by intermediaries. According to John Romita Sr., who succeeded Ditko as the artist for Spider-Man, the two disagreed on how to handle their characters. The exact reasons for the strained relationship between are not entirely clear, as both men had different perspectives on the matter. However, there were several factors that were likely contributed to their difficulties working together. One issue was creative control. Ditko was known to be very protective of his creations and had a clear vision for his characters, while Lee was more focused on developing storylines that would sell well. This led to a conflict over direction of the comics and who had the final say on certain aspects of the story. Another issue was financial compensation. Ditko reportedly felt that he was not being paid fairly for his work, particularly compared to Lee's compensation. This was because Stan Lee never considered Ditko a co-creator of Spider-Man. In Sean Howe's Marvel Comics The Untold Story, Lee recounted a conversation where Ditko told him, having an idea is nothing because until it becomes a physical thing, it's just an idea. He had complained to me a number of times when uh, there were articles written about Spider-Man which uh, called me the creator of Spider-Man. And I had always thought I was because I'm the guy who said, I have an idea for a strip called Spider-Man. Having an idea is nothing because until it becomes a physical thing, it's just an idea. And he said it took him to draw the strip and to give it life, so to speak, or to make it actually something tangible. It, otherwise, all I had was an idea. So I said to him, well, I think the person with the idea is the person who creates it. And he said, no, because I drew it. Steve definitely felt that he was the co-creator of Spider-Man. And that was really, after he said it, and I saw it meant a lot to him, that was fine with me. So I said, fine, I'll tell everybody you're the co-creator. That didn't quite satisfy him. So I sent him a letter. I put it in writing. To whom it may concern, this is to uh, state that I consider Steve Ditko to be the co-creator of Spider-Man along with me, something like that. And I sent it to him and I said, you can show this to anybody you want to. And I found out that Steve still objected to that because he felt, I used the word consider, I consider Steve to be the co-creator. Apparently he felt that wasn't definite enough. So at that point I gave up. I mean, we just, um, I haven't spoken to him or heard from him since, I don't think. But do you yourself believe that he co-created it? I'm willing to say so. That's not what I'm asking you to say. No, and that's the best answer I can give you. So it's a no then, really? Pardon me? So it's a no then. No, I really think the guy who dreams the thing up created it. You dream it up and then you give it to anybody to draw it. I mean... But if it had been drawn differently, it might not have been successful or hit, I suppose. Yeah, but then I would have had created something that didn't succeed. Ditko returned to Charlton Comics. He traded Marvel's higher paying rates for a more creative freedom in his stories. Between 1965 and 1968, he was the driving force behind Captain Adam, Blue Beetle, and The Question. The Question was a lone vigilante, inspired by Ayn Rand's philosophy of individualism, who exposed corruption in his daytime identity as a journalist and punished wrongdoers as a faceless, perfect judge. However, Charlton's financial decline led to the character being taken out of Ditko's hands and later revived by DC with a toned down violence and more Buddhist perspective. During the same period, Ditko contributed to Warren Publishing's Creepy and Eerie series, two horror anthology magazines. In 1967, Ditko created the character Mr. A, a vigilante inspired by objectivism philosophy. The character debuted in Wit's End number no. three, and an underground comic anthology for creator-owned content, initially published by Wally Wood. Mr. A gave out vigilante justice that was even more unforgiving than that of the question, unbound by the comics code. He confronted crime as a journalist and a mass champion of justice in the black and white world where there was only right and wrong. Wearing an emotionless steel faceplate, Mr. A delivered ideological monologues while ensuring that those guilty of ethical compromise paid for their crimes. From 1967 to 1978, Ditko regularly worked on Mr. A stories for various publishers, with the final story in the series being published in 2009. Ditko joined DC Comics in 1968 and created The Creeper, who was introduced in Showcase 73 in April of that year. Ditko also introduced the sibling duo Hawk and Dove in Showcase 75. 
Ditko left DC Comics in 1969 and shifted his focus to working primarily on Charlton Comics until the mid-70s. During this time, he contributed to the first issue of Heroes, Inc. Presents Canon, 1969, and became the main artist for Liberty Bell in 1974. In 1975, Ditko joined Atlas Seaboard Comics, owned by Martin Goodman, Marvel Comics' former owner. There, he co-created Destructor and worked on two issues of Tiger Man and one issue of Morlock 2001 before Atlas Seaboard shut down later that year. Ditko then returned to DC Comics where he created an anti-hero stalker and Shade the Changing Man and worked on Etrigan the Demon, The Legion of Superheroes, and Man Bat Stories. Unfortunately, Ditko fell prey to the DC implosion in 1978. That's where DC Comics was expanding in a bunch of variety of different titles, but then they actually imploded, so then they started canceling all those brand new titles. At that point, Ditko returned to Marvel Comics in 1979 to take over the series Machine Man, and also wrote stories for Captain Universe and the Micronauts. Although back at Marvel, he refused to work on his previous co-created characters such as Spider-Man. In 1980, he co-created Dragon Lord, but the character was not well received by readers. Between 1984 and 1986, Ditko was the artist for the long-running series featuring Rom the Space Knight. He then co-created Speedball, a teenage superhero for Marvel 1988, which led to a 10-issue series where he was the main artist and contributed most of its plots. After its cancellation, Speedball joined the team book New Warriors. During the 1980s, Ditko also contributed stories to Pacific Comics, Eclipse Comics, First Comics, and Archie Comics, including The Fly, Fly Girl, and Jaguar. Also in 1982, Ditko served as the main artist for a new science fiction series called Astral Frontiers under a contract with Western Publishing. Unfortunately, the series was shelved and Western ceased publishing comics in 1984. The 1990s was the dawn of a new century, and this was a period when Steve Ditko started fading away from the comic book scene. He continued to draw comic books, but they became very hard to find, and only a small group of superfans were able to locate them and appreciate them. He was like a ghost, present but not quite there, and although his contact information was available in the phone book, he remained a mystery to anyone who wanted to learn more about him. In a sense, he had stopped engaging with the world long ago, and the reality he depicted in his artwork didn't match the world we were living in. In the early 1990s, Ditko contributed stories for Valiant comic characters such as Magnus the Robot Fighter, Solar, and Exo Man of War. Starting in 1992, Ditko contributed a crossover story featuring Iron Man and Doctor Doom in Marvel Super Heroes Volume 2 Number 8. This story introduced the character Squirrel Girl, who gained a cult following and eventually received her own comic series after joining the Great Lakes Avengers. She was among the last original characters Ditko created for Marvel and the last one to achieve popularity. In 1995, Ditko served as the main comic artist for a comic book miniseries adaptation of the then popular French American animated series, Phantom 2040. This was among Ditko's last major mainstream works of the 1990s, which included a one-shot publication for Dark Horse Comics, Define Comics, and Fantagraphic Books. In 1998, Ditko had mostly retired from comic books. Although writing a few stories for Iron Man, Submariner, even the Power Rangers, his final mainstream work was a five-page story featuring the New Gods. It was intended for publication in 2000, but DC delayed it and then it got published in 2008. During the last decades of his life, Ditko focused mostly on creating and publishing his own creator-owned stories which were largely circulated through his longtime associate Robin Snyder, a formal editor of Charlton Comics. Although these works didn't receive wide circulation, in 2008 Ditko did publish the essay The Avenging Mind, a collection of editorial cartoons titled Ditko Etc. Throughout his career, Ditko had created several creator-owned characters, but the one he returned to the most frequently was Mr. A who had been articulating Ditko's ethical principles since 1967. Mr. A, with his uncompromising enforcement of the absolute moral code, could be considered an anti-hero in the vein of contemporary characters like Judge Dredd, Martial Law, and Frank Miller's Batman. However, Ditko did not see him as such. To Ditko, Mr. A was a pure hero in a time where heroes were hard to come by. In an interview in the documentary In Search of Steve Ditko, Writer Alan Moore described Rorschach, a character from The Watchmen, as having a ferocious moral integrity. Even his politics were completely mad. 
He went on to say that this was his interpretation of Steve Ditko. Throughout the 2010s, Steve Ditko continued working from his Manhattan apartment, where he lived alone, with no spouse and no children. He passed away in June of 2018 from a heart attack. He was actually dead for two days before anyone even noticed. After he died, his family had difficulty opening his office door because it was blocked by piles of unopened correspondence. Despite his immense talents and contributions to the medium, Ditko was known for his reclusiveness and reluctance to give interviews or make public appearances. But he would still find time to write back fans that sent him letters. In conclusion, Steve Ditko was a true legend of the comic medium, whose influence can be seen in the works of countless artists and writers who have followed in his footsteps. His work on Spider-Man and Doctor Strange helped to define Marvel Comics in the 1960s. His commitment to his own unique vision and principles continued to inspire a new generation of comic book writers and artists. While he may have been a reclusive figure in the later years, his impact on the world of comics will be felt for generations to come. His final essay, which was published a year after his death, included his last printed words, in which he acknowledges his friends and his enemies. In a phrase that says, Here's to those who wish me well, and those who don't can go to hell.